the Diels-Alder reaction is rich with stereochemistry. And as in the last webcast, we're going to use some observations about the stereochemistry of the reaction to draw some conclusions about the mechanistic details of the reaction. So if you take a look at this slide, what you can see is that the reaction is stereospecific with respect to the dienophile. That means that if the dienophile is trans in the starting material, as it is in this top case, then the substituents off of the carbons that used to belong to the dienophile will be trans in the cyclohexene product. Similarly, if the substituents are cis in the starting material, as they are in this bottom case, then the substituents will end up cis in the product. Importantly though, the absolute stereochemistry of the reaction is uncontrolled in the absence of some chiral ligand or other chiral influence. So we'll see either this compound or its enantiomer as the product of the Diels-Alder reaction between these two substrates here. The reaction is also stereospecific with respect to the diene. This means that if the substituents on both double bonds of the diene have the same stereochemical relationship, then the substituents will end up cis in the product. So here we see a diene with two trans double bonds, and unsurprisingly, the two phenyl groups end up cis in the product because both double bonds are trans. Similarly, if both double bonds are cis, as in this case, then we see yet again a cis relationship between the substituents, the hydrogens here. On the other hand, if the double bonds have different stereochemical descriptors, as in this case where we have a trans and a cis double bond in the diene, then the substituents will end up trans to one another in the product. And really, I think the best way to think about this is just to imagine drawing a C shape where the double bonds of the diene are in the S-cis conformation. If both substituents are outside of the C shape, as in this case, or in this case, where we're looking at the hydrogens, then those substituents will end up cis in the product. On the other hand, if one substituent is inside the C-shape and the other is outside, as in this case, in which we see the methoxy is inside and this methyl acetoxy is outside, then we'll end up with a trans relationship between the substituents. The important take-home message from these observations of stereospecificity is that they strongly support that the bond-making and breaking processes in the Diels-Alder reaction are concerted. The reason they support this conclusion is because if the bond-making processes were not concerted, then the substituents would have time to rotate as the bonds were being formed, and we would see mixtures of trans and cis products. Because we only observe one diastereomer in these reactions, we can conclude that the bond-making process is likely concerted and the substituents are forced to maintain their stereochemistry in transforming from reactant to product. You'll notice that up to this point we've conveniently avoided examples in which we form stereocenters on both the former diene and the former dienophile. Now we're going to take a look at this and ask the question, is there any relationship between the relative stereochemistry of stereocenters on the former diene and stereocenters on the former dienophile. So if you take a look at the reaction at the top of this slide, you should notice that there are two stereochemical possibilities in terms of the relative stereochemistry between the stereocenter on the former dienophile and the new stereocenters on the former diene. The substituent on the dienophile can either be on the same side as this carbon bridge, we call this the exo-stereoisomer, or it can be on the opposite side of this two-carbon bridge, and we call that the endo-stereoisomer, because the substituent is closer to the double bond in this stereoisomer and farther from it in the exo. So which is favored, the endo or exo-stereoisomer? The observation that's usually made is that the endo-isomer tends to be favored. The reason for this has to do with orbital overlap between p orbitals on the substituent on the dienophile and the p orbitals of the diene. There are two ways that this dienophile could approach the diene, with its substituent pointing towards the diene or away from the diene. If the substituent is pointing towards the diene, then the result will be the endo product. On the other hand, if the substituent is pointing away from the diene as it approaches, then we would see the exo product. The reason that 
the substituent wants to approach the diene before the alkene even reaches it is because there's orbital overlap between the p orbitals on the substituent and the p orbitals of the diene. So as the dienophile approaches and a reaction takes place on the orbitals of the alkene and the termini of the diene, there's a secondary orbital interaction between the carbonyl group and the two back p orbitals of the diene. This stabilizes the endo transition state over the exo, favoring the endo product. Hopefully in this webcast, you've learned a little bit about how we can use experimental observations to draw mechanistic conclusions about chemical reactions. In the next webcast, we're going to come full circle and fully describe the mechanistic details of the Diels-Alder reaction using what we've already learned about its concerted and stereospecific nature.